we just received this silver play button from YouTube as an acknowledgement for reaching 100,000 subscribers. But this is also an indication that people are actively searching for alternative media outlets which concern geopolitical, economic and social matters. So to celebrate this milestone, we're going to hold a Q&A. And these questions have been submitted on Patreon. They concern the channel Caspian Report, as well as geopolitical topics which we hadn't had the chance to cover yet. So without further ado, welcome. And my name is Shirvan. So let's get this started. The first question by Fluffy Unicorn. He wants to know about the situation in Moldova. Well, the current president Dadon, he is friendly towards Russia and he was part of the former communist government. But he's also the man who negotiated with the European Union concerning the visa liberalization and trade agreements. So he knows the benefits of cooperating with Europe, even though he is pro-Russian. Ultimately, what we're probably going to see is Moldova on a neutral path. Dadon is not going to be a Russian puppet, he's also not going to blindly follow the EU. He's going to keep the country on a neutral path. Next question. Kevin wants to know about the Baltics and what Putin is going to do over there. Well, the Baltic region, much like all the other former Soviet territories, are part of the core interests of Russia. Putin is obviously going to respond to the NATO militarization over there, but he's not going to do it overtly, rather covertly. A large population in the Baltic nations are ethnic Russians. These are fault lines to be exploited. I think within a few years we could see protests erupting in major Baltic cities by ethnic Russians who will claim to be persecuted by the authorities. Bombings may happen, assassination attempts, anything really to destabilize the region. This will create the environment for Moscow to step up. So it's going to be rough. Next question. Math wants to know about Brexit, whether it's going to be beneficial for the UK or not. Well, Brexit will certainly be beneficial for the UK in the long term. In the short term, however, it's going to be rough. However, the fact is that the UK is an island nation. Its interests are not aligned with continental Europe. Rather, the geopolitical interests of the UK are somewhere in between the US and Europe. Not aligned with either one, but somewhere in the middle. And that's where the UK is headed towards. To explain the full scenario, I would have to make a separate report on the UK, perhaps something on British geopolitics. Anyway, next question. Colin basically wants to know about Russia's opportunities and vulnerabilities in Europe. This is a really good question. I think 2017 will be a complicated year for the Russians. They will have a lot of opportunities in Europe because of weakening European institutions, because of polarized European societies. But back at home in Russia, their economy is faltering. The Russian strategic reserve is expected to be depleted this year, meaning Russia will run out of cash in 2017. Just think about that for a second. This means that the Russian leadership, as it runs out of cash, will be willing to take greater geopolitical risks. Continuous geopolitical flashpoints will include Georgia and Ukraine, but new emerging geopolitical flashpoints will include the Baltics and even the Balkan region. Bosnia is not doing so good right now, especially after that referendum. And besides, I think that Trump will be unable to reconcile with Putin. So that also plays a role. Let's go on to the next question. Edward asks about Brexit and Scotland. Well, a possible outcome is that Scottish officials bring forth another referendum and this second referendum actually succeeds. So Scotland breaks away. It would obviously create an awkward situation for the British government, but it's entirely possible. Next question by Bakker. He wants to know which country I'm from. Well, I'm from Baku, the capital city of Azerbaijan. It's a small country in the Caucasus by the Caspian Sea, hence the name Caspian Report. It's a country that sits right in the middle between Iran, Turkey and Russia. And historically, these three empires have fought long wars over the Caucasus and their influences are still felt today. So next question. Edward wants to know what the Visegrad group can bring to the EU politics concerning the migrant crisis. 
Well, the Visegrad nations will obviously reject the EU regulations concerning the migrant crisis, but their criticism will be limited. These countries need the EU. That being said, the Visegrad group has little say or impact on the future of the migrant crisis. It will play a bigger role in Eastern Europe to come, especially Poland, but that's a question for another time. Next one. Nicolas wants to know about the information sources that I use and about the European Army as a replacement for NATO and about Adam Curtis. Well, I'm not familiar with Adam Curtis or his work, but your question has intrigued me, so I will check it out. As for the European Army, it's not going to happen. I don't even believe that the European Union will exist in a few years. And your first question, I have a broad range of sources. I have, for example, 10 sources on Iraq, five books on the history of the Middle East. One source that I usually use, for example, on Syria is Al Mastar. They provide accurate and timely news outlets on the strategic events in Syria, the military status in Syria, etc. It's a very useful source. And you just don't get this kind of information in the mainstream media. But to go over every topic, it's going to be a quite a list. What I can do and what I do recommend is you to check out the Intel briefings, which I weekly publish on Patreon. These are news sources which I read and release and share with the Patreon audience. So check that out. Next question. Mehmet asks whether Turkey will join the Middle Eastern Cold War between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Well, truthfully, Turkey is already engaged in this Cold War. Currently, Iran has the upper hand, but it's not going to last. The fact of the matter is the majority of the people in Syria and northern Iraq are Sunni Muslims. And as the Sykes-Picot borders are breaking down, people are associating themselves with religion and kinships. So when they have to choose, they will choose Sunni Turkey over Shia Iran. Next question. Miho wants to know about the Turkish combat capabilities. Well, Erdogan's purge has hurt the ranks of the Turkish military and has significantly decreased their combat capabilities. The situation as it is today kind of resembles the Stalin's purge of the Red Army in 1936 to 1938. Back then, the Red Army was simply not ready for Operation Barbarossa by the Germans. So, yeah, next question. Miguel wants to know about the geopolitics of an independent Quebec and whether Canada should form its own foreign policy. To answer your first question, I think an independent Quebec will have little impact on the current state of affairs in North America. In fact, there could be a Chinese independent state and it would change nothing. Your second question is interesting and actually I think you answered it yourself. Canadian wealth and prosperity stems from the fact that it has aligned its interests with that of the United States. Any deviation from this path would be extremely destructive. Canada is like the Ukraine of the United States. Geopolitics is often unfair. Some countries may host their own flags, but they're not really independent and have little say in foreign affairs. If you want to test this rule, it will be extremely unwise. Next question. Stephen asks three questions, which I will answer in one answer. I studied journalism and Caspian Report started out as a project during my studies. The lack of objective information is what really bothered me back then. Most media outlets try to insert their own views on the audience. There is always a good guy, a bad guy. There, this is how you should think, this is how you should feel. They try to mold your opinion. But honestly, most of the alternative media on the internet is really not any better. They delve into inconsistent theories or conspiracy theories or engage in cherry picking of information. That is actually not better than what you see on the television. So the end result is really a disrupted view of the world and most audiences are left really confused. And the ultimate goal of Caspian Report is to provide accurate and objective information on geopolitical, economic, and social matters. Next question. 
TWP asks one what news outlets do you use and what is your take on Europe for the long term well I strongly recommend to check out the Intel briefings which I share on patreon it basically covers nearly everything you need to remain updated as for the final question the second question I'm convinced that the European Union will cease to exist within a few years. I've mentioned this before, even back in 2011, but the EU has thus far failed nearly every economic, political and social test. I think the European Union will collapse and it will start with a crash in the Eurozone. Following this, regional blocs will emerge. Think of a Eastern European Union, Scandinavian Union, etc. Next question by David. He wants to know my experience, background, what got me interested in Caspian Report and what information sources I use to stay current. Well, I work for an Azerbaijani TV channel called Ishtimai TV and as a special reporter I was usually tasked to cover topics in Europe. I also work for the Azerbaijani Foreign Ministry and this is where I really started to grasp the harsh realities of geopolitics but eventually I left. Your second question, what got me interested in Caspian Report? Well, my primary interest is to provide objective information. I don't want to live in an Orwellian world with alternative facts or doublespeak. As for your last question, the list of sources is too long to cover here. So instead, I highly recommend to follow the weekly Intel briefings on Patreon. I will further refine the feed, but basically the intel briefings are a list of sources that I consider important. Next question, Ryan basically wants to know how the future is going to play out. And there are a number of questions in this question, so I'm going to answer it as best as I can. As I've mentioned before, I think the European Union will cease to exist. It will collapse and instead regional blocs will emerge. As for Trump, I don't think he will be able to reconcile with Putin. There are too many factors that restrain Trump in this. Even if somehow the US abandons its European allies, Eastern Europe under Polish and Romanian leadership will form its own bloc to contain Russia. So escalation in Eastern Europe is unstoppable. You also mentioned Article 50 in your question and I have to answer this by saying that I believe that the British government will activate Article 50, but it's going to be a very disruptive period for the UK. In the remainder of your question, you basically ask for the long-term playout. Well, I think that we're going to see historical powers re-emerging to the geopolitical scene. Think of Poland in Eastern Europe. Think of Turkey in the Middle East and Japan in East Asia. It's basically the return of history. That's what we're going to experience now. Next question. Ifes wants to know about the isolation policy of the United States and the military industrial complex in this sense. Well, first of all, your name sounds kind of Dutch, so correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, to answer your question, I don't think that Trump will be able to reconcile with Putin. The US defense budget for Eastern Europe was recently increased from 800 million in 2016 to 3.4 billion in 2017. That's the opposite of reconciliation. Trump is not going to be able to reverse the budget. Doing so would upset his military advisors as well as the lobbies from the military industrial complex. This odd reality reveals how Trump, as the head of the state, is actually powerless to improve its relations with Putin. Next question. Rowan asks about the geopolitics of New Zealand. Well, New Zealand has no foreign policy of its own. Much like Australia, New Zealand's prosperity is completely dependent on maritime trade. Hence, New Zealand depends on the leading maritime power to secure its interests and wealth. For now, that maritime power is the United States. In other words, New Zealand has minimal influence in the Pacific region. If it had any influence, it would collide with American interests and that is something you may want to avoid. Next question. Rod wants to know about the future of American politics. The truth is Trump may have ran as an outsider but he will govern as an insider. 
The same restrictions Bush and Obama faced, Trump will have to deal with as well. Think of lobbying groups, his advisors and much more. There is actually a great book for this, check out the Plato's Republic for how governments gradually shift through time. Next question. Alan wants to know about Duterte's switch of allegiances to China. That is a really interesting question. Essentially, China offered a far better short-term deal, whereas the United States offered a better long-term deal. But where the Chinese checkmated the Americans is the fact that they understood the value of short-term results in democracies. The fact of the matter is that in democracies, leaders usually focus on short-term results because they have electoral responsibilities, especially populist leaders like Duterte. China offered Duterte a way to expand his approval ratings in the short term. In the long term, the country is going to be hurt by this, but for now, Duterte has secured his approval ratings. That's what basically happened. Next question. Samsung wants to know whether it's safe or not to talk about politics in Azerbaijan. Well, thank you for your concern. It's safe, as long as you don't mention the government. If you do, then it gets dangerous, as someone will probably knock on your door. In fact, in Azerbaijan we have a saying, Siyasete Garishma. It means, don't meddle in political affairs. You can talk about everything you want, just not about the political system in Azerbaijan. That's a freedom luxury we do not have. Next question by Wail. He wants to know about the short-term, mid-term and long-term goals of Caspian Report. Well, the short-term goal is to increase the quantity of content without sacrificing the quality. The mid-term goal is to increase the number of Patreons and make the channel economically feasible. The current financial overview in Patreon is actually inaccurate. On top of the total sum, I have to pay percentage fees to my bank as well as to Patreon. Following this, I have to pay taxes to the government. If you talk about politics in Azerbaijan, you best be paying your taxes. And the long-term goal is to find like-minded people and motivated people to help expand the coverage and content. Next question. Max wants to know about the reality of Pizzagate. Well, I think it's fake news, but more importantly, I think it's irrelevant. There is a good reason why I never delve into scandals. I look at history, geography, demographics, and I search for patterns of behavior. Without these factors, an analysis becomes completely dependent on the personalities of a politician. And politicians lie, conceal, and deceive. The moment you analyze a situation through the words of a leader is the moment that news becomes biased. That is something I want to avoid. Instead, I look for factors surrounding the personality or ideology and what are the restrictions that limit the options of those in power. In any case, I want to thank Patreons for submitting these questions and I want to thank you, the viewer, for being part of Caspian Report. And if you enjoyed this vlog and if you want to support our network, please check out our fundraising page for more perks, rewards. We've got some great ones, including polls, intel briefings, google hangouts and much more. So perhaps we could continue our conversation there. Anyway, take care and so on.